Hey guys, welcome to Trucking and Talking episode 9. My name is Matt. And yeah, about not as long since I uh, last recorded one of these. Um, what actually prevents me from doing if well, more, like, by, by I say more, I think my eventual goal is to have one of these a week. Um, there's a lack, lack of hard drive space. I, I I mean, I may have a one terabyte drive, but it's not a lot when you have loads of games, video recordings, photos, videos, all sorts of things, really. So, it's not a lot when you have all that, but eventually I hope to get another two terabyte drive or something about that size. And yeah, I, I don't really want to go with a regular hard drive because I found them to be quite unreliable. I mean, they're going to fail eventually, but I'd rather not buy a drive and have it fail before the end of life of the PC that I run before I change everything anyway, after I don't know, five or six years. So I'd rather go with a solid state drive, even though, yeah, they can still fail. The failure rate is much less, plus they consume a lot less power. You know, the very the newest standard of M.2 doesn't require any cables. And yeah, it's just all around more appealing, but more money. So yeah, uh, that's basically part of the reason for it. Well, it's the main reason. Um, anyway, um, reasonably reasonable length of video, I'd say. Um, I guess make up for it, really. Um, you probably may have noticed. I'm already driving the the man, the newest truck to join your truck, the man Euro 6, which is nice. Um, it's a nice quality truck. It sounds uh, decent. They're not perfect, and there's not a massive amount of customization, but there's at least some. And yeah, that's about all I have to say about it, really. It's a perfectly decent truck to drive, but mods still do a better job. <laughs> anyway. Um, so first topic here is uh, Google turbocharging and back button, new Chrome's back forward cache. Um, so the company claims that 19% of pages on mobile Chrome from hitting back. Did that make any sense at all? Because that didn't make any sense to me. Um, Google's developing a new cache for Chrome. I see that that should make some page loads extremely fast. The only catch, <laughs> I see what they did there, the pages you've already seen revisited after hitting the browser back button. Chrome already <coughs> already catches the files that make up the page. So revisiting a page in most circumstances shouldn't force the browser to. Re rev retrieve. That's the word I was looking for. The images, JavaScripts, and C CSS that he used to build the page, but currently the browser has to repass the repass HTML and rebuild page programma programmatic representation. Uncompress the image. Re re Execute the JavaScript, reapply the style sheets, and so on. It's just the networking step that it's just the networking step that gets skipped. Well, I guess then if you have slow internet, that could help a bit. But uh, caches generally aren't the best thing because they can cause unintended consequences, like having too much browser space taken up in it collapsing on itself, which has happened before to certain browsers. The new BF cache, back forward cache, <laughs> changes that. It lets browser capture the entire state, well lets the browser, sorry, capture the entire state of a running page, including scripts that are middle of execution, the re rentarded images and even the scroll position. No, rendered. <laughs> <laughs> rendered images and even the scroll position after reload 
that state later with BF Cash rather than having to reload the page from scratch. The page will look as if it was paused when you clicked a link to a new page and subsequently resumed when you hit back. Oh, my reading. I mean, I, I think the problem is my brain's reading faster than I can speak, so I sit here and think, what is it? And then my brain's on the next sentence. Joys of reading, eh? <laughs> um, unlike file caches, which can accelerate the loading, new pages and can spam browsing sessions, the back forward cache will only accelerate pages you've already visited. So it's not really going to be useful in loading a new page. Um, as you name the, as the name imply, implies, it's only for navigation by even the back and forward button to revisit the history, but Google says such visits represent a significant part of typical browsing sessions with some 10% of pages on desktop and 90% mobile revisited the way, which is a fair point. I mean, I, I personally find I'm visiting the same sites all over again. So, yeah, people like me are quite useful. Mm. Safari and Firefox have been using a similar kind of cache for years. Safari calls it page cache since 2002, while Firefox calls it BF cache. As presented in some form since Firefox 1.5 in 2005. And by the way, I won't use Firefox ever again. I'm not interested in it. It's weird and very finicky. So. Well, Google's Bing engine has common heritage with the WebKit engine of Apple Safari. Google's I chose to use WebKit's counterpart. Counterpart to the BF cache saying that it's incompatible with Modi process model that Chrome uses. Um, it then continues into more detail. This article it ends up by saying this work. This work to enable in Chrome will be sustainable. A number of different parts of the browser need to coordinate every, to ensure every part of every page, even background scripting, is frozen correctly. According to the feature, it's going to be developed this year, but isn't likely to be found in stable builds of Chrome until 2020, which is nice, I suppose, because then we won't have the problem of uh, hopefully not as many bugs, but it's still possible. So, I suppose, what do I think of this? Uh, good, I guess. I mean, someone like me could be quite useful and maybe save a little bit of time, but, I mean, in theory, if you're, browsing, if you're visiting fairly well-designed websites and you've got decently f a decent speed of internet connection, um, it could become redundant, but for now, I can see this being useful for websites that aren't that well-written and people have much slower internet connections as well be quite useful for them. So let's move on to the next article. And it's not surprising that Apple. How Apple and app developers will try to entice you to subscribe, not just pay once. Now to me this isn't really anything new. I feel like companies any company's been doing this for years. Like, just one example, I suppose, when you buy a car, um, the salesman, if you're buying from a main sort of dealer, the salesman probably going to try and get you to subscribe to some sort of service plan, maybe, or some sort of uh, maintenance, saying if you do this to the car, you'll get it fixed for no cost, something like that. You know, or to try and not only make money out of you then, but continuously make money out of you. Which YouTube kind of does, I suppose, but at no cost to you, unless you choose to, you know, s s now sort of subscribe or join to a channel, you know. Um, so for a while now, Apple's been encouraging app developers to consider subscriptions as a key revenue source, and the company is introducing some new options for developers that hopes it will make the option more attractive in the past few days, Apple has informed developers that they will now be able to target current and recent subscribers with promotional rates on subscriptions. This means developers will be able to offer discounts and try to get you back if you lapse. What, so if you just fall asleep and forget it? <laughs> Maybe? 
Or if they might, or they might try to in, entice you to stay if you consider leaving. Well, everyone does that, don't they? When you say uninstall this program, let's just say, or cancel this service, you'll you'll get the finger. Well, you, will you tell us why? Are you, are you sure you won't tell us why? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? And this goes on and on and on. So nothing new there. <laughs> um, I suppose maybe just more annoying. <laughs> um, developers could previously offer limited time subscriptions, discounts, but only to new users. The model is n the new model is available in the recent beta release of iOS 12.2, Mac OS Mojave, and tvOS, and it's likely to be included in the final public release for each Apple World facilitate three different types of offer to developers who will regain who will retain and regain subscribe subscribers. Yeah. Um so there's what Apple describes is how they describe free pay as you go and pay up for I'm not gonna read them out but you know make what you will out of them. Um uh, to deploy these offers, developers will need to implement new store kit APIs using the latest beta release of version of code Xcode that they can use to the off the all aforementioned iOS, macOS, tvOS. But the offers will not become available to users until the feature is publicly available. Uh, Apple has already made some offers to the iPhone users from Apple Music but this is the first time other developers on Apple's platform can reach Labs subscribers this way. Apple specifically positions the feature as one for resubbing Labs to users. The company writes, you can, you can use subscription offers to help win back subscribers who have cancelled their subscriptions or promote an upgrade to other subscriptions at a special price. Now what I hear when they say that is we can make more money out of people who thought they could get away with us we're gonna make twice the money out of them now because they thought they could leave us but they realistically they actually can't that's that's, that's kind of what I hear when I hear that to be honest when I read that out to myself um, Apple also clarifies that users will be able to take advantage of Offers even if they've already participated in a similar initial sign up offer where they have first subscribed, further developers will be able to target a list of users with set subscriptions to pay the next 10 day and use these to convince them to stay. Apple reportedly gathered developer, developers of all types, making of games, productivity apps, photograph, photography apps and so on in New York in 2017 to make their case for subscriptions as viable even on mobile. Games and high-end productivity and creative work suites have used this model on PCs but it was previously somewhat rare on mobile. Anyone using new iOS, re reg iOS apps regularly has probably seen that change. And it goes on to talk about Apple's cut, which is 30%, which isn't quite as much as I think YouTube takes out of someone's... Uh, the money that they take, 45% or something, and at least 30% off of um, donations, but... Anyway, yeah, no surprise really, I don't think. I think Apple's really just trying to make more money here. I don't think they're at all interested in the user getting a better experience or using this to make their products better or less buggy or allow you to do more things. I think this is really just trying to build up the Apple cult and make as much money as physically possible. So yeah, uh, take what you will from that. Next. <laughs> This is how your brain on bungee. This is your brain on bungee jumping. Cliff divers take to the leap for science. I just had to read this article when I saw it. Um, right before you work up the nerve to leap off bungee jumping platforms and plummet towards the air, there'll be a sharp, measurable increase in your brain activity almost a full second before you make the conscious decision to jump. A newspaper and scientific reports. Per, per, oh, I can't even read the word. P 
P U R. Ports. Purport. Purports to describe the first time the effect has been measured outside the laboratory. Lab <laughs> laboratory. <laughs> lab 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 tree. <laughs> lab laboratory. Yeah, laboratory. That's that's the word. Um, the telltale signal that was dubbed the beneficial something potential BP or reading reading nurse potential in English was first observed in 1964 by Luda Decker <laughs> and Hans Henmut Kornhuber Kornhuber and Decker had subjects made hundreds of voluntary finger movements while otherwise sitting as still as possible in a Faraday cage the researchers noticed a shift in electrical voltage in the brain as measured by EEG electrodes placed against the scalp. The effect is often called ongoing heated debate over whether humans truly have free will. The German and Austrian, Austrian authors of the current study studied opted to have their subjects go bungee jumping in hopes of record in hopes of record this reading 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 this potential while bungee jumping has its roots in an ancient ritual on the southern pacific island nation of van Utah, as well as the best way to test one's courage prior to studies have shown how it's results in a sharp rise in concentrations of the beta endorphins right after jumping. The spike, the spike, this spike is despite the fact that the authors know bungee jumping is statistically less life threatening than more common activities like bicycling. Bi cycling? <laughs> no, what's the bicycling? Cycling or dancing? My impulse reactions are non rational. Granted, the study just only had two participants, both which were only 19, male semi-professional cliff divers who had never gone bungee jumping before. So even though one assumes that they were accustomed to jumping from sleeping heights, both participants reported they had been very strong and inner resistance to jump off before the trial. The author's right. They also they added that they should offset most Decent, decent, decentralization effects, although they cannot rule out completely. Most people bungee jump for the first time, apparently experience similar initial resistance, often requiring an external trigger to overrule the instinct not to jump. I don't think I'd need that if I went skydiving. I think I'd be like, "Ooh, let's jump!" We <laughs> personally, that that's what I think. Um, the two men jumped from the 630 foot high Europa Bridge near Innsbruck, Austria, a total of 30 times. <laughs> that sounded like, why wasn't I invited to do this? Um, to avoid generating extra signals resulting from muscle movement, they were instructed to keep head motions and blinking to a minimum. The jumpers were also told to relax <laughs> the arms and trunk. Imit in in. It imitating the jump by coming on toes and bending forwards. A portable EEG with a built-in build accelerometer was used to record brain activity. As a baseline, the jumpers also made a similar number of jumps from a height of about three feet in the safety of a lab in a laboratory. I could say it right then. Um, This is still not a huge number of jumps given that the recorded EEG signals are average for the of final results. The author suggests perhaps using VR technology for further experiments to co complement the real world study. The researchers conducted the experiment with an eye towards using their findings to improve the current crop of brain computer info. In interfaces, BCIs, devices that can translate electronic signals in the brain to into, into control c commands for electronic devices. This study is valuable proof of the principle since the results clearly demonstrate that experiencing fear before making a potential life-friendly action does not have much effect on 
the reading this potential. That's good, good news for the quadrupelic patients, for example, who may rely on BCI controlled neutral prosthetics for simple movements like eating and navigating a computer screen. So that's an interesting one, really. Um, yeah, I wish I'd been invited, to be honest, because it did. The idea I can jump 30 times from 630 feet. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> That's what I say. Anyway, next article. Um, more controversy, this one. Uh, HBO boss quits the zona. AT&T seeks more money and more profit. Uh, Richard Pelper, a 28 year old veteran of HBO, was reportedly frustrated by the new owner. HBO CEO Richard Ple. Oh, I just said it. Ple. Ple. announced his resignation yesterday, less than a year after ATT completed its acquisition of HBO and the rest of Time Warner, Incorporated. In the company wide memo available in the Hollywood Reporter story, Pepler told employees that he had made a difficult decision to leave and an infected point in the, in this in the life of this wonderful company. Pepler worked at HBO for nearly 28 years, serving as chairman and CEO since 2013, as co-president from 2007 to 2013. He st struck a positive tone in his memo. Thanks to all of you, we are today churning on all cylinders, both creatively and as a business, he wrote. Thanks to all of you, I can move on to the next chapter of my life, knowing that the best team in the industry remains here to carry on the continued progress and success. Um, so, continues, HBO has succeeded for decades, producing a limited number of high-quality shows, but shortly after AT&T completed its purchase of Time Warner, June 2018, the new Owner told HBO employees at a town hall staff meeting the network wasn't making enough money. <laughs> yeah, we gotta make more than, I don't know, $15 million a month. <laughs> HBO need more content to keep viewers' attention for hours every day to get more data and information on customers. Stanky, Stanky told HBO employees at the meeting, Stanky warned employees could face a tough year and they would need to do a lot more work after a change of direction a bit. Um, changes sought by AT&T seem to be geared towards making HBO a bit more like Netflix, the biggest streaming video provider. Plupia uh, and HBO Entertainment President Casey Bluff Employees had brushed off some suggestions that HBO would need to keep up its content rally. Um, content tally, I mean, most modest in comparison to Netflix, but also all changed when AT&T Warner Media was formed. Hollywood Reporter article said this network is looking to ramp up its original offerings in an effort to stay competitive with Netflix, Amazon, and Teen other upcoming streaming rivals. AT&T CEO Randall Stevenson speaking about HBO parent Warner Media and Creative Imagination told the Wall Street Journal last year that you need to that you that you need to guard your culture with life. But Stevenson also said that the business model doesn't have to change and that it would be a very difficult mi migration. Pepper's departure came days after federal uh, appeals upheld AT&T's acquisition of Time Warner, dealing a blow to the Justice Department. Justice Justice Department's attempting to reverse the merger. Um, so kind of like Apple again, really trying to make more money. Um, also, I apologise if at some point there, while well, laughing or something, I somehow uh, you heard a big. Pop, I apologize for that. Um, so, yeah, a lot like Apple, really, that they want more money. I don't care how much money it's making now, they want more and they want more. They're only consider considering the short term, they're not considering the long term. And realistically, they will, they, the more control they have, the better, because then they can, you know, um, give 
contributions I say that sarcastically to more people and just gain more control and it just spirals from there really um, yeah Alphabet subsidy subsidiary trained AI to predict wind output 36 hours in advance Intermittent power supply is a problem for the grid and predicting it has a value. Um, Alphabet sub 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 did sub sub subsidiary subsidiary DeepMind it was acquired by Alphabet in 2014. Has been developing artificial intelligence programs since 2010 to solve complex problems. One of DeepMind's latest projects, according to recent Google posts, has centered around the predictability of wind power. Those giant turbines you see along the highway only produce power when they're moving, and that poses a big problem for the grid in absence of an expensive energy storage. It's difficult to plan how much power those turbines will be able to provide. That's not to say the wind farm owners don't try to predict the output the industry. Uh, has been using AI techniques for years to try and come closer and closer to real wind predictions. But wind is still difficult to predict. In fact, ENE News published a story today showing just how difficult it is to predict wind farm output during Midwest's recent polar vortexes. Wind output fell, but temperatures continued to drop. Some turbines automatically shut down to keep their parts from being damaged below 22 degrees Fahrenheit. Not really sure what that is in Celsius. I'm sure you could predict that right now, you pause the video and pull up the calculator. Um, this left an unexpected defect in wind power for the mid-contents um, independent solar organization shown below, and they have a graph showing it. Um, I have a screenshot of the article, of course. And all, of course, I forgot to say, all, all the articles, I think you know by now, will be linked, all the site, all these articles are on, will be linked, and if if you have any articles you want me to talk about, feel free to suggest them. I'm open book to that. Uh, the DeepMind says the AI programs it has developed over the last year can help bring the wind output line even closer to the expected wind output line. The allograms, I'm not sure how you say the word, developed by DeepMind were trained on historical weather data and the years worth of wind power output recorded by 700 megawatts worth of wind turbines owned by Google. Uh, DeepMind and Google wanted to be able to predict the wind output 36 hours in advance. This is important because energy sources that can be, can't be scheduled, i.e. deliver a set amount of electricity at the same time, are often more valuable to the grid, Google wrote today. Well, I think that'd be fairly obvious, wouldn't you? Um, that model that DeepMind developed to help wind farmers like Google make hourly commitments to the re regional power grid a full day in advance. Google says this ability to accurately tell to the local grid manager how much wind a farm will provide a day ahead has boosted our wind el energy value by roughly 20%. That doesn't surprise me, to be honest. Um, compared to a baseline scenario and no time based commitments to the grid, how qualifying, how Google's qualifying value is unknown, but the last reached out for clarification. Um, so, what I think of this is it's a good idea in theory, but my problem with this is still that you still can't 100% predict this, and I think they realise that, they don't, they don't obviously want to say it, but people, um, well, no, not people. But the weather is very unpredictable, and it's true today as it was 10 years ago that beyond the one day forecast, you really can't predict what the weather's going to do. It's n not logical at all, there's no real patterns in it. It does all sorts of weird things and never really does exactly. W it may be close to what they predicted were going to happen, but it's never near exactly, so it could be potentially very dangerous if they. If there's let's just say an event on in town that's going to use lots of power and they say yeah 36 hours from now when the event's going on they'll be fine and all of a sudden there's a major turn in the weather halfway through that event and then the power's down and it's you know very dangerous so that could arguably that could happen with power at the moment even if it didn't like that so 
Eventually, that's not as big of an issue, but it could still be an issue. Amazon's latest program to curb admissions one day delivery per house per week. Amazon's been testing the program with a few of its customers, but now it says it's become official. On Thursday, Amazon announced it'd be making a program widely available to Amazon Prime members that would only allow them to schedule deliveries for a single day once a week, so their Amazon Day service would be voluntary and target customers that are concerned about their carbon footprint. Grouping purchase deliveries will help Amazon cut down emissions associated with spending sending a delivery truck to the same house multiple times a week, and the company said holding orders for a single day will, during the week will also allow groups to order single package delivery there by reducing the packaging. Customers can select their preferred day of the week to receive shipments according to CNN. Customers can also add their items to their Amazon Day shipment up to do days in advance of shipping. Customers can also choose their, to remove their Amazon Day delivery and it shipped more expe expedious, expediously if necessary. Select Prime members have already had access to the program, but it was only made to all Prime members as of today. And that is um, end of February 2019. Um, Mark, Mark Rentz, Vice President of Amazon of delivery experience that Amazon said in statements that Amazon Day Pilot Program has already reduced packing by tens of thousands of boxes. I'm all for saving the environment, but still hope they didn't send stuff in boxes that were like twice as big as what they were sending in it. They'd just be better if they may have made a smaller box for it. Um, the program is part of Amazon's plan to get 50% uh, shipments to net zero carbon emissions by 2030. The company has already led a 700 million investment round for a company called Rivan, which promises to make electrical pickup groups in a van available in late 2020 and late 2017. Amazon tests out hydrogen fuel cell f forklifts in its warehouse as well. Previous studies suggest that Amazon may have good luck getting primaries to select Amazon Day. So this isn't a bad idea in theory. Arguably, it's a little bit annoying, perhaps, but then I don't really know anyone that wants delivery more than once a week to them. You know, I doubt anyone that's spontaneous, and if it was that big of a deal to them, they'd just order it from somewhere else, wouldn't they? You know, I'm all for saving the environment, being more helpful to the environment, but, you know, they should still make smaller boxes. Because having a box in a box in the bag of a box to a box of a bag is not friendly for the environment, no matter how, if you're doing it to less packages. Okay, next. <laughs> McLaren knocks out its park again with the 720S Spider convertible. It's lighter, more powerful, faster, and more usable than the outgoing 650S Spider. So in 2016, they tested. Last Technica tested the McLaren 650S Spider. Carbon fiber drop top supercar that we thought was so clever it deserved a PhD. For three years, a, a long time in the supercar world, the 650S is old and news meet the McLaren 720S Spider. It too is made from carbon fiber. But now it has a 3.8 liter twin turbo V8. It's more powerful than the 4 liter twin turbo V8. The car also has a new roof mechanism that goes up and down in just 11 seconds. At the same time, the new model is lighter and the more than the out lighter than the outgoing Spider by 83 pounds or 38 kilograms, whichever one of those you understand, uh, making it the lightest car in its class compared to the Ferrari Pista Spider, the Lamborghini Hurricane Performante Spider, and the Lamborghini Aventador Roadster S. I don't know which one of those the Ferrari is. Um, I've not heard of that car before, to be honest. Um, it's stupendously fast and extremely eye-catching. Both of these qualities are one you 
Both of these qualities want you to be spending 31... F no, 315... Thousand US dollars on supercar, but it's also amazingly easy to drive, civilized to live with, and pretty good on gas or fuel. Uh, capable of hitting 60 miles an hour in 2.8 seconds while topping out at 212 miles an hour. And there are some beautiful screenshots here if you go onto the side of the car. Um, looks absolutely stunning, really. Um, especially the, well, not only including the interior, but the metals on the car. The, the, I mean, it looks great in this paint. And this uh, silver looks absolutely stunning. It really does. And he goes on to talk about it in quite a lot more detail, um, such as the roof. Um, you can drive with the roof up at cruising speed on the highway. It's very refined, and that's not bad. Top down at 70 miles an hour. Um, as we drove the 720s on the road. We didn't get close to its handling limits, but those are apparently more exploitable now thanks to the new generation of proactive chass chassis software and supercars like these that are always in more danger of driving at legal speeds and feels boring because it's so far below the car's limit. While 720S did feel a little less alive than the Ferrari 488 cruising at 70 miles an hour. The feedback from the student was very communicative and was engaging. Older than the old crowned footwell. My only complaint was with the soundtrack or their lack of. Its overcharged engine is always going to sound boring and muted compared to a naturally aspirated one. Just compare the Ferrari 488 with its previous success, and if you don't believe me, it's possible to add some character. As the hardcore LT600 Spider proved that day, if the, L if the 650S Spider was a supercar of the PhD, this must make the 720S Spider a supercar that just landed a trend, trend to position out of straight grade school. That didn't make 100% sense to me, but no, fair enough. It looks like a great car, and yeah, I suppose I wish I could own one, but I can't. So anyway, that's pretty much going to end the video here. Um, again, all those articles, I'll link the site at the Ars Technica, and if you want to read them up in more detail, and any articles you want me to talk about, um, I'd be happy to, or any topics, and ticker, I'm pretty much open to anything really, and yeah, I really hope you enjoyed, and um, until next time, thank you for watching, make sure to hit the subscribe button, until then, until next time, bye for now.